Hi, we're here with Mal Stanley at the Wangaratta International Festival of Jazz and it's a behind the scenes look at the man behind the scenes who's looking after recordings. Hi Mal. Um, I, first off, I'd just like to ask you, where did you develop an interest in jazz? Uh, through the ABC, coincidentally. It was um, mainly listening to the jazz programs late when I was a teenager, Music to Midnight with uh, Ralph Rickman and Ian Neal. Um, and that caused me to go out and buy my first jazz album, which I think was an Errol Garner LP. Um, and then some Dave Brubeck. Um, I was also uh, working in a pop band at the time. And when I joined the ABC, I started recording mostly classical music, but started doing a few jazz sessions for Paul Petron, who was the music deli producer in Melbourne, who used to produce music for Jim McLeod's jazz track. Um, and after I did a few of those, um, I kind of really got into it. The good thing about recording jazz is it's a wonderful hybrid between acoustic music of orchestras, but it's got the intimacy of dealing with a small band and the musicians without some of the uh, kind of um, the length that it takes to do some pop recordings. It's very, in the moment, it's very immediate and it's very creative. It's wonderful seeing it created in the studio and also live, which is where we are at the moment, recording, documenting the performances at the festival. Okay, great. And how long have you been with Jazz Track? I've been presenting Jazz Track for nearly 10 years, when Jim McLeod retired in 2004. Uh, but I was involved with the program from about 1993 when I started really recording jazz, really getting into that, and then I pretty much exclusively started to devote my time to uh, recording and producing recordings for use in Jazz Track. And then when Jim retired in 2004, he'd been presenting jazz since 1976, it's that program and other programs before that. Uh, he retired and they asked me, uh, in their wisdom I guess, to, uh, to take over and um, uh, I've all kept up my recordings as well, as many. We also record in other states apart from where I'm based. Um, but it's a very important part of what we do to record uh, largely Australian music and Australian composition especially, as well as capturing the international artists. Um, part of the reason why we do it, uh, apart from getting material for broadcasters to really try to uh, add something to, uh, to the jazz scene in Australia to, to give opportunities to musicians to record professionally to get their music to, uh, in a broadcast sense and also to release material because a lot of the recordings that we do artists can license for a reasonable fee from the ABC and put it out commercially and there's, there's probably been uh, I think a last count over 100 recordings if not more that have come out that way. <clears throat> it's an important thing too because it costs a lot of money to our studios. Great. And have you um, seen many changes in the jazz musical landscape over the years? Yeah, I think um, uh, I think the effect of the jazz education institutions has um, been quite profound, really. Um, there's a bit of, a, I guess, a, a passing of the torch in some ways. There's a lot of younger musicians who have been through the colleges. Um, I'll talk about this with my colleagues today. There seems to be a, 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 a great emphasis on, on ensemble sound now as opposed to um, the, just the parts of the band. Uh, that, that There's still certainly a place for a more traditional approach to, to jazz performance uh, with, with soloing, but it certainly seems to me that a lot of the musicians seem to be more interested in how does the whole band sound, how does the whole aesthetic of the band sound as opposed to just a chance to do soloing. And that's reflected also in the types of compositions that aren't just the straight head in, choruses, head out kind of thing. That still happens, of course, it's part of the jazz tradition. I think the younger musicians who may not have necessarily grown up listening to or been taught about uh, the bebop era, the Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, all that sort of era, that they're coming from a, a different point of view. They're listening to indie pop, all sorts of influences, and they're bringing that to to what is loosely called jazz. It's a difficult sort of title, really. It encompasses so many different styles that, that I guess, at their base have an imp improvisation. It's a fairly core element, uh, but not always, you know. Um, so it's, it, it's morphing all the time, jazz. It brings in influences from outside, as well as creating its own. And I think it's in a very healthy state, to be honest. I see um, there was a big fear when some of the big labels dropped all their jazz rosters, like Universal, uh, and verve. But in fact, there seems to be a mushrooming amount of artist-run, artist-run, medium-sized labels, let America like Palmetto and 
the sunny side. And in Australia we've got you know, labels like Jazz Head that do a good job at Listen Here Collective in Perth. Um, those sort of labels and uh, live music that seems to be in Australia you know, a, a really fine tradition of live music. And one other thing that's been happening is the rise of large ensembles in, in music in Australia in particular. People like Mates Fans, Francis running his large bands, uh, the uh, EMO band from Brisbane. Venice Big Band in Melbourne, there's quite a few big bands there. Uh, Ralph Pyle's band in Sydney, the, the new one, Divergence Jazz Orchestra. Um, it's a great thing, it gives, gives uh, composers a chance to hear their music in large ensembles and also performance opportunities for musicians playing in a large ensemble as opposed to the solos. Okay, great. Thanks so much for your insight into um, the life behind the scenes and, and a little bit about Australian jazz. Okay. Thanks, Mal. See you later.